This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 292 of the program. Today is Friday, May 28th, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of the folks who make this show possible. All of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes the great Amanda Prochnow, Carol Pepe, Gary Johnson, Hamada Ganatpour, Isaac Sadake, Stuart Clark, and Zafar Kaiser. Thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. We've got another great episode for you today. We will talk about Marjorie Green and her comparison of mask mandates to, yes, the Holocaust. Not shocking at this point for her. Also on this episode, Laura Ingram warns viewers of incoming climate lockdowns. Charles Koch is funding the effort to end prohibitions on evictions put in place because of the pandemic. Namiki Kant challenges a disingenuous Fox News host. Televangelist Jim Baker explains how him going to prison is actually another form of cancel culture. The Senate wants to give Jeff Bezos' space firm $10 billion. Liz Cheney proves me right about her disingenuity. Joe Biden backtracks on another key promise. The squad folds on a key vote and also abby martin won her lawsuit against georgia that's what we've got on the agenda for today's episode let's jump right in and waste no time i hope you all enjoy the episode this woman is mentally ill you know we can look back in a time in history where people were told to wear a gold star and they were definitely treated like second class citizens so much so that they were put in trains and taken to gas chambers in Nazi Germany. And this is exactly the type of abuse that Nancy Pelosi is talking about. In case you were wondering what Marjorie Taylor Greene was comparing to the Holocaust, mask mandates. That's what she said was comparable to the Holocaust. Now, thankfully, for her sake, she had a second chance to correct the record and walk back that idiotic statement. So let's see how well she does. The American Jewish Congress has expressed concern over your comments comparing mask mandates to the Holocaust. Do you stand behind those comments? You know, here's what I, here's what I stand by. We shouldn't be having this kind of treatment. No one should be treated like a second class citizen for saying I don't need to wear a mask or saying that my medical records are my privacy based on my HIPAA rights. And so I stand by all of my statements. I said nothing wrong. And I think any, any rational Jewish person didn't like what happened in, in Nazi Germany. And any rational Jewish person doesn't like what's happening with overbearing mask mandates and overbearing vaccine policies. Do you understand, though, why some would be upset and offended by the comment? Well, do you understand how people feel about being forced to wear masks or being forced to have to take a vaccine or even have to say that whether they've taken it or not? These are just things that shouldn't be happening in America. This is a free country, and it's just ridiculous to have these kind of conversations. Bro, she's literally not backing down. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, I just have to say, no, it is not a violation of HIPAA to ask for someone's vaccination status. That's incorrect. But I mean, if given another chance to correct the record via Twitter, perhaps make some sort of a public statement, what is she going to do? Well, of course, she's going to triple down. So she tweeted out, vaccinated employees get a vaccination logo just like the Nazis forced Jewish people to wear a gold star. Vaccine passports and mask mandates create discrimination against unvaxxed people who trust their immune systems to a virus that is 99% survivable. You know, the Nazis had pieces of flair, but they made the Jews wear. What? Just keep tweeting through it, Marjorie. I'm sure it'll get better. I'm sure that the backlash will start to dissipate after a while. I mean, she's just, it's, it's almost impressive how stupid this she is. This woman is mentally ill. She genuinely 
is so confident in the idiotic assertions that she makes. And in a way, like, I kind of admire it. Like, who has that much confidence to so boldly say something that wrong? But say it as if you're you're correct and everyone else in the world is uh, is wrong. Now, because she keeps saying melodramatic and moronic things like this, even House GOP leadership is coming out and condemning her, including Mitch McConnell, as well as House GOP leader Kevin McCarthy, who states Marjorie is wrong in her intentional decision to compare the horrors of the Holocaust with wearing masks is appalling. Now, in that statement, which we're not going to read, he goes on to basically say, but what about the squad? They've also said terrible things. They've said anti-Semitic things. I mean, that's what they're trying to do. Whenever Marjorie Taylor Greene says something terrible, they'll invoke the squad to make it seem as if they're equivalent. They're comparable when that's not actually the case. Like, she's the individual who floated the conspiracy theory that's anti-Semitic about some sort of Jewish space laser being responsible for the California wildfires. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. This is a former QAnon conspiracy theorist possibly current QAnon conspiracy theorist. So, I mean, there is no bottom to how low she'll go. Like, sky's the limit, or I should say, floor is not the limit. <laughs> That's probably more appropriate. But Marjorie Taylor Greene is making Republicans look so bad that even Ben Shapiro Hold up. decided to publicly denounce her on his own volition, saying via Twitter, this is demented nonsense. It is nothing like the Holocaust and any comparison there too is both insulting and insane. I mean, when you're a conservative that loses even Ben Shapiro, then you know you've messed up. Now, I know what you're expecting here because she did respond to Ben Shapiro. You're probably thinking, well, I'm sure she just did what she's been doing. She probably quadrupled down and said the same exact thing. Actually, she took a turn here. She did a little bit of a pivot, and now she's just denying that she invoked the Holocaust when discussing mask mandates. I'm not kidding about that. She says, I never compared it to the Holocaust, only the discrimination against Jews in early Nazi years. Is that so? Is that so, Marjorie? Uh, can we get a fact check on that, please? This woman is mentally ill. You know, we can look back in a time in history where people were told to wear a gold star and they were definitely treated like second class citizens, so much so that they were put in trains and taken to gas chambers in Nazi Germany. And this is exactly the type of abuse that Nancy Pelosi is talking about. Mm hmm. So, yeah. You know, it's really funny to see Republicans like Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell come out and denounce her and make it seem as if she's crazy and they want to separate themselves from her. Here's the thing. This is the logical conclusion to the Republican Party's pandering to crazy people. For years, these are the types of folks who you've appealed to, and little did you know one day they might rise up and run for Congress and possibly take over your party one day. I mean, this is the Republican Party. You could try to distance her, all you uh, distance yourself and your party from her all you want. But the fact remains that the base sides with people like Marjorie Taylor Greene over individuals like Liz Cheney. Now, Liz Cheney is bad. She's objectively a bad person. If you think that war is terrible, then I think objectively it isn't necessarily something that is uh, very controversial to say. But people in the Republican Party are siding more with individuals like this and Donald Trump. So this is the bed that you made, Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell, and now you're having to lay in it. Now you're having to deal with the repercussions of a crazy person making you all look like buffoons. Well, you shouldn't have pandered to these types of individuals. Now, Marjorie Taylor Greene did put out a thread where she says the word sorry at the end of it, but at the same time, she still kind of doubles down. So she doesn't necessarily want you to think that she's not sorry for comparing mask mandates to uh, Jews and them being murdered during the Holocaust. Having said that, though, she doesn't necessarily feel that bad about it. And um, yeah, we'll leave that there. Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, is going to continue to say and do crazy things because this is a crazy person. And if you think that she is like the last... Uh, of what Republicans have to offer in terms of ghouls, I mean, 
I'm sure in 10 years, we're going to think that Marjorie Taylor Greene looks sane in comparison to what the Republican Party has to offer down the line. I mean, it wasn't too long ago when we all thought it was inconceivable for someone like Sarah Palin to rise through the ranks of the Republican Party and actually become prominent. But then Donald Trump became president. Then Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Greene, QAnon conspiracy theorists, got elected to Congress. So if you think that this is as low as they can go, think again. This individual could become president. This is America. Donald Trump did get elected president. So I'll leave that there. Marjorie Taylor Greene once again proving that she is absolutely verifiably insane, but uh, very proud of the stupid things that she says. This is Dunning-Kruger in action. This woman is mentally ill. The CDC reports that more than half of U.S. adults have received at least one dose of one of the COVID-19 vaccines, and as a result, cases continue to fall, which means in the United States, we are finally starting to get the virus under control, which might mean that lockdowns are very soon coming to an end. But according to Fox News' Laura Ingram, this is actually a bad thing. Bad for the left and liberals and coastal elites, more generally speaking, because we actually love lockdowns, according to her. We like lockdowns because they're not necessarily used in order to mitigate the spread of this highly contagious, deadly disease. They're used by us to control the masses, control real Americans. That's literally what she's going to argue in this clip that we're about to watch. But even though the lockdowns due to coronavirus are coming to an end, she tells her boomer audience that there's a new type of lockdown that they should be afraid of. Climate lockdowns. This is literally something that she says liberals and leftists are planning. Climate change activists who ignored or dismissed the human suffering caused by these draconian COVID rules were positively giddy. That kids were harmed from the cancellation of in-person learning and athletics was simply not relevant, given the left's larger long-term goal of reducing America's carbon footprint. So they saw COVID as an opportunity to advance the interests of a global climate bureaucracy. Their pet media marveled about the environmental benefits of lockdowns, again, ignoring human suffering. If there is a silver lining to this crisis, it's visible in the skies above China. All of this inaction, while causing so many humans problems, has actually proven to be quite good for Mother Earth. If falling pollution levels brought about by lockdowns may have uh, been shining an impact on sunshine. Wild animals are now roaming city streets. How do we make sure these pollution levels don't rebound? So the longer you were behind closed doors, not commuting to work, not going to church, not traveling to see family, the happier those people were. But having a free country means that individuals are making their own risk assessments according to their own risk profiles. The Greeniacs hate that. They much prefer to order you around, or if that's not possible, to frighten you into abandoning your own common sense. So mindless COVID fear-mongering kept suburban women double-masked on running trails and sent urbanites to Amazon Prime for all their grocery orders. My favorite is when they were frantically wiping down their bananas and their egg cartons worried about COVID. You know, the virus can live on surfaces, for example, stealing plastic for up to three days. I'm just gonna clean all the virus off here. Don't need to do too much. It's a pretty sensitive virus. For cardboard, it's typically gonna be closer to 24 hours. Of course, none of that was true, right? But he did do a good job of cleaning. But after some fits and starts, we won the COVID debate. Their so-called public health experts were wrong on everything from lockdowns to masks to social distancing. Those measures inflicted enormous economic, educational, and psychological harm to adults and children alike. And Biden's attempt to take credit for this notwithstanding, it was Trump who greenlit Operation Warp Speed. Yet now we see the usual suspects lining up to exploit another hyped crisis. Of course, I'm talking about climate change. And the end goal is the same. They want more of your money and your freedom. And if they have to take extreme measures to accomplish this, oh, they will. I mean, what do you even say to that? What do you even say to that? She is pulling this out of thin air. She's fabricating it. She doesn't cite a single example of anyone in a position of power floating climate lockdowns. Her evidence that the left and liberals 
who are in power want to institute climate lockdowns is that some pundits pointed out the fact that during these lockdowns, the silver lining was that our carbon footprint collectively was reduced. So therefore, because they pointed that out, because they made that ob observation, it is now a fact that climate lockdowns are coming and you should be very afraid. I mean, think of the tacit assumption that liberals and leftists aren't like other human beings. We actually loved the lockdowns. I loved not getting to see my family for an entire year. I loved it because I just liked that conservatives were getting controlled, even though they violated the lockdowns. I mean, who thinks like this to just completely dehumanize people who you disagree with because they're concerned about the pandemic to just assume that there's no legitimate reason to do a lockdown, to wear masks, to social distance in order to mitigate the spread of the virus? I mean, you're just a stupid person if you genuinely believe this about other people. If you genuinely believe that everyone celebrated the lockdowns and they loved it. That's fucking stupid, Laura Ingram. And you know this. She knows what she's saying, but her audience, who's older, who's less informed, they don't necessarily know. Now, unfortunately for Laura Ingram, she's not as effective as a propagandist as someone like Tucker Carlson. So I think that they're going to be less like to, likely to be afraid of climate lockdowns. But so long as Fox News wants this narrative to get pushed, all they need is for someone like Tucker Carlson with more credibility, who's more believable, to say it. And now all of a sudden, everyone in the country will be talking about climate lockdowns because this is what Fox News does. Does anyone remember uh, Muslim no-go zones? That was a big thing back in, what was it, 2014, 2015, where they were claiming that there were areas in Europe and London where you weren't allowed to go unless you were Muslim. They were trying to fearmonger about Sharia law. It came to Europe and it's coming to the United States very soon. I mean, they always want you to be afraid. They always want you to live in fear. And then simultaneously, they claim that that's what the left and liberals want because they're taking this virus seriously. It's preposterous. And nobody who's serious about climate change has proposed permanent lockdowns that's unsustainable and that's not going to solve the climate crisis but if laura ingram actually wondered what we want to do to stop climate change all she had to do was ask one of us except she knows though right because she's against the green new deal as well that's what we're proposing we're proposing investments in renewable clean technology hydro wind solar and on top of that, we want governments to rein in the 100 multinational corporations responsible for 71% of all greenhouse gas emissions globally. But Laura Ingram doesn't actually want to talk about what we want to do to stop climate catastrophe. She just wants to lie, straw man, and a uh, fear monger. And whatever solutions you propose, she's going to shoot that, that down as well at the behest of her fossil fuel advertisers, at the behest of Fox News' advertisers within the industry that makes a lot of money polluting the planet, ruining the environment. Now, I hope that you didn't miss the line where she said they much prefer to order you around, or if that's not possible, to frighten you into abandoning your own common sense. This is quite literally what she's doing in this segment. And don't pretend as if ordering people around isn't the right forte. You order people around all the time. You claim that you care about uh, freedom and personal liberty, but that's not true. You're ordering people around on a daily basis. This is the entire conservative ideology. You guys are the traditionalists, right? You want to ban abortion, stop women from having autonomy over their own bodies. You want to stop trans high school girls from participating in school sports. You want to stop gay people from having uh, equal rights, not being discriminated against. So you boss people around all the time. So what are you saying that this is what the left wants to do? The states who were responsible in implementing lockdowns and mask mandates, they didn't do this because it's their kink to be authoritarian and have many dictatorships in states like California and Oregon. They did this because of a fucking pandemic that's so bad it comes around only once in a century. Now, of course, there are hypocrites within the Democratic Party, Gavin Newsom, Nancy Pelosi, but were these objectively the correct measures to take during a pandemic? Yes. And anyone who disagrees with that is not a serious person. They're admitting that they don't care about the pandemic. Laura Ingram is implicitly telling you that she doesn't care at all that more than 500,000 Americans died during this pandemic. All she wants to communicate to her audience is that the left and more specifically liberal politicians are bad because they took measures, drastic measures 
but measures that were appropriate because of this pandemic, measures to stop those deaths from racking up. Now, she adds, we won the COVID debate. Their so-called public health experts were wrong on everything from lockdowns to masks to social distancing. So she's declaring victory without even making an argument, except what were you right about? Masks work. That's a fact. They are absolutely useful in stopping the spread of COVID-19. This is an airborne illness. So of course masks work. What are you even saying here? What are you implying? Because there was the uh, clip of the CNN host or the CNN doctor wiping down the grocery products. That's like evidence that the left is wrong because we now know that COVID-19 isn't likely to spread via surfaces. I mean, okay, we were learning more about the pandemic as it went along, and we still don't know everything there is to know about the pandemic. We still don't know why it has basically no effect on people. They're asymptomatic, but other people die from it. We're learning about this. This is a learning process. So because we grow with more information and we adapt with new information, that doesn't necessarily mean that people were wrong. You were wrong about everything. Your network is promoting misinformation about vaccines, and yet as vaccinations increase, cases go down. So by that measure, you're wrong. So what she's saying here is just shameless propaganda. Absolutely idiotic virtue signaling to her right-wing audience who she desperately wants to stay glued to her television show and television network. So what does she do? She keeps them afraid. Trust me, this is what you all should be afraid of. And uh, I'm going to tell you what you should be afraid of next. Just keep coming back. Keep cons consuming my media. Eat up my propaganda. And I will make sure you know all the good things to be afraid of. Don't be afraid of actual threats, like a highly contagious deadly disease that killed more than 500,000 Americans. I'm going to tell you the real threats. It's climate lockdowns. It's immigrants. That's the real threats in America. If you've been watching conservative media lately, uh, over the past couple of weeks in particular, and I hope you haven't been, by the way, but if you have been, you can see in real time the construction of a brand new narrative that serves two purposes. Not only is it an attempt to demonize the left, and brazenly so, but also it simultaneously validates their anti-vax position as it relates specifically to the COVID-19 vaccines. It's kind of a spin on the Matt Boris comic, which makes fun of the conservatives who claim that you're a hypocrite if you criticize society, yet participate in society. And I mean, if we live in a society, obviously you don't necessarily have a choice as to whether or not you participate in it or not. But I mean, this time, the claim is that if you rely on modern medicine, if you support vaccinations to stop the spread of a highly contagious, deadly disease, congratulations, you're a big pharma shill. That's literally the argument that anti-vax right-wing pundits are making uh, against the left. Thankfully, Namiki Konst was on Fox News to push back against this narrative, and she was so effective that the Fox host felt compelled to cut the interview short because she was making too much sense, I'm assuming. But take a look, and then I have quite a bit to say about this. $5.6 billion in revenue to Big Pharma so far through the COVID-19 vaccine. I've read your Twitter feed. I've seen a lot of your comments, Namiki. You've been pretty aggressive. You've said that conservatives or anyone else who has questions about the vaccine are anti-vaxxers. You pointed Joe Rogan, I believe, once and called him an anti-vaxxer. Is it wrong to have questions about the motivations of this vaccine? Is it wrong right now to remain skeptical of Big Pharma? Well, I love that you're skeptical of Big Pharma, just like Katie Porter was skeptical of Big Pharma uh, just yesterday, who's a representative from California, a Democrat, and just like Bernie Sanders has put forward three pieces of legislation to rein in on Big Pharma and the fact that they're focused on profits. Listen, AbbVie, this is a pharmaceutical company, made it spent $1.6 billion in five years on research and development, yet $50 billion went to shareholders, $13 billion went to stock buybacks in, during that five-year period. Their priorities are absolutely Namiki, that's in the wrong absolutely, places, That backs be, up the point. I'm sorry, Namiki, but the question isn't why yeah, I, I have grown skepticism towards Big Pharma. The question is why those on the left, like yourself, have become such blind followers of Big Pharma. Why is it if you have questions... Well, Namiki, you've been calling anyone that would question Big Pharma when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine an anti-vaxxer. When did you place your trust so blindly in people that stand to make $5.6 billion from this vaccine? 
the definition of intelligence is being able to hold two thoughts in your head at the same time and be able to consider. Big Pharma makes a lot of money and they're not spending enough money on research and development, which is where their sh priority should be. But they so should be trusted blindly on this issue? pharmaceuticals are stronger. It's not blind. The science is out about the vaccines. The vaccines work. Should there be a booster? I'm no scientist, but neither is Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan should not act like a scientist. Joe Rogan should not be telling now, people Mickey, not to wear masks, here's the, not here's, to here's the take truth. the vaccine. This is he what is I'm concerned about. I'm concerned planet. you are a big vaccine booster now, not not because you believe the science backs it up, but because the vaccine has come to represent a political ideal, a political signifier, a political yeah. fight on which you think you can win and claim the banner of science. But the wild thing about it, Namiki, is it exposes hypocrisy so blatantly for anyone on the left right now. Do you realize that Big Pharma, when it comes I to... I think that's absolutely... Hold on, I'm hold sorry, on, no hold on, really quickly. Put do you realize... But that is a Bernie Sanders bill. Do you realize that the vaccine <laughs> you're, you're, makers... You're supporting the left right now. Excuse me right now. I'm, I'm supporting you're, you're su honest Americans having independent free thought to make a choice about what they inject into their body. And I think when the pharmaceutical companies have complete liability protection on the COVID-19 vaccine, you on the left have chosen a unique time, a really interesting time to all of a sudden call, all, all of a sudden call people who clear. have questions anti-vaxxers. It anti was the Republicans who pushed the liability protection. It was not the Democrats. The uh, Bernie Sanders and Katie Porter are the ones that are advocating to rein in on the pharmaceutical companies' profits so they can put more money into research and development. Which only Do begs the question. Do you think that we shouldn't have pharmaceuticals? Namiki. So which uh, only begs the question, why now did you do which only begs the question, why now did you do an about face and all of a sudden say that anyone that has questions is an anti-vaxxer? Why now? No, 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 no. I think Joe Rogan is an anti-science person. There's a difference between being an anti-vaxxer and believing that COVID doesn't exist. He did not believe COVID really existed until recently. I mean, that's I, the, uh, the difference I don't think that's here. fair, we believe in science nor do I reason, think that's accurate. Which is why pharmaceuticals should spend money on research and development and not their right. shareholders. That's the difference. The profit I think, uh, motive. The, the Mickey... profit motive should be in science. I'm sorry. Yes. I think that's an unfair characterization of what Joe Rogan said or what he believes. I think that you on the left have found a very unique time on an emergency use application vaccine that has complete liability protection to switch to all of a sudden have an about face on your trust in big pharma. And I think you did it. I think you did it because have, you thought it I was a win over science. Republicans. That's all. Nothing no. more, no, nothing no. deeper. The Republicans want to keep their base. See, what's happening right now is you guys want to prolong. The pandemic is ending, and you want to keep everybody angry at COVID and the assault on freedom because you have to wear masks. It's God forbid you have to keep your community safe and your grandmother safe. You want to keep that going because it's been working. I got to run to make you. I want to say alive. two things. I thank you for coming on the yes. program. I always enjoy a spirited thank exchange you. of ideas, and I think that what I'm standing up for tonight is I'll independent Americans <laughs> having the ability to make freedom of choice specifically on the very intimate decision of what they inject into their bodies. Thank you, Namiki. I support freedom of choice when it comes to intimate personal medical decisions. By the way, also, I think we should ban abortions and criminalize gender affirming care for trans youth. I mean, you're a hypocrite. Conservatives have absolutely no room to preach freedom in the realm of individual health decisions because for decades, they've been on the wrong side of an issue that society is desperately trying to move on from abortion, and they're currently on the wrong side of history when it comes to trans issues. But I just got to say here, uh, Namiki Konst, excellent job here. That is exactly what a leftist should do if they get invited onto Fox News. Second of all, by this guy's logic, the only people who can actually legitimately criticize Big Pharma without being hypocrites are faith healers who don't rely on any modern medicine at all. So you're a hypocrite if you criticize Big Pharma if you've ever taken medication. So my nephew who takes insulin, apparently he is just a Sanofi shill, right? He needs insulin to survive because he has diabetes, but little did he know, he's actually just patting the pockets of the CEO of Sanofi. What a shill. I mean, this is the logic. I'm being hyperbolic, but obviously if you extend that logic to its conclusion, that is the argument that this buffoon is making. He adds, uh, you've been calling anyone that would question Big Pharma when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine an anti-vaxxer because they're anti-vaxxers. When did you place your trust so blindly in people that stand to make $5.6 billion from the vaccine? Obviously, this is a very low IQ position to take, and he's deliberately misrepresenting the left's position. The left isn't blindly placing their trust in big pharma the left is saying scientific data indicates that these vaccines are highly effective and they're safe so if you want the pandemic to end this is the correct measure to take mass vaccination so we reach herd immunity so we can all move on but you're just saying oh well you know what this is you shilling for big pharma 
Because if you want people to take the COVID-19 vaccine, you actually have an ulterior motive. You don't really care about them getting vaccinated and being safe. You care about the profits that Big Pharma is making. Is that really the argument that you're making? I mean, talk about bad faith. What a fucking bad faith lunatic you are. The crux of the left's argument is that pharmaceutical companies are prioritizing profits over people. They prey on people who rely on their drugs to survive and knowing that people have to take these drugs to survive, they then jack up the prices in order to increase profits. I mean, it's exploitative. That's the argument that we have against big pharma. And a lot of leftists argue that we should nationalize some of these big pharma firms. Of course, pharmaceutical giants like Pfizer should be nationalized. We shouldn't have privately manufactured COVID-19 vaccines, but this is what we get. We live in a late stage capitalist society. So because a private option is the only solution, we shouldn't reject it just on principle. We should do what's necessary to end the fucking pandemic. This isn't hard, right? This isn't difficult. You're not a hypocrite if you're against big pharma, but you promote vaccinations. But this Fox News host is grasping for straws because he is anti-vax himself, and he desperately wants to find some way to validate his position and also simultaneously demonize the left. And what's shocking to me is that all of these capitalists on Fox News, they don't even understand their own system. What's more lucrative for a company like Moderna or Pfizer? Ask yourself this. Is it more lucrative to just create some sort of ineffective or even unsafe vaccine that you distribute and then people get sick and they immediately uh, stop taking it i mean is that going to be better for long-term profits or is it more lucrative to actually make an effective and safe vaccine but be the sole manufacturer of the global supply of said vaccine what's more profitable what do you think is actually going to be the best thing that this pharmaceutical company should do. I mean, that's not to say that we shouldn't be concerned with the safety of these drugs. Of course, they'll cut corners to save a buck or two, but that's why we support regulations on the left. It's the right who is in favor of deregulation. Trump boasted about all of the deregulation that he did. So yet, you support a president that deregulates, including the pharmaceutical industry, but then have the nerve to claim that it's the left who's promoting these unsafe vaccines when they've been proven by scientific data to be effective and safe i mean i, I just I, I can't take it like the disingenuity here is so over the top he's so hyperbolic so disingenuous nobody who watches this should take this guy seriously but unfortunately we live in a country of a lot of uninformed people with a lot of uninformed people rather and they actually think that this argument is persuasive and if namiki Konst wasn't there to push back on his bad faith attacks on the left then they would just gobble up the propaganda. Now, what I love is that after this imbecile implied that Namiki Konst is a big pharma shill because she's pro COVID-19 vaccines, he then goes on to suggest that really she's only taking this position, not because she wants to end the pandemic, not because of the scientific data that's available for everyone to see. It's because she's a partisan hack. It's not the Fox News host who's the partisan hack. It's the leftist who wants to end the pandemic that's killed more than 500,000 Americans. That's actually the partisan hack. Here's the thing. Facts don't care about your feelings and the scientific data that's widely available that you could be reporting on, that's not partisan. Choosing to believe it, that is partisan because Republicans made it partisan. You're the ones who politicized the pandemic. You're the ones who said early on that we should sacrifice grandma to the gods of the markets in order to make sure that we don't lose profits, we don't hurt the economy. Your network argued for herd immunity early on and just pretend as if the pandemic isn't a thing. And yet this buffoon is claiming that it's the left. They're the ones being partisan because they want to end a pandemic. Give me a fucking break. It's like saying, if you want to cure cancer, you're being a partisan. Why are you supporting, you know, chemotherapy? It treats cancer, but sure, it also is really bad for people's health. You're basically injecting poison into your body. Why is the left so partisan in this here? Can't you denounce this poisoning of people, chemotherapy? I mean, this is the level of disingenuity we are dealing with here. So this individual, I don't know who he is. I haven't seen him on Fox News before, I don't think. But I mean, this is a blatant propagandist. And thankfully, he's not a very persuasive propagandist. And it didn't take much effort of Namiki Konst to completely dismantle the argument that he was making. Of course, you're not a big pharma shill if you support COVID-19 vaccinations, and uh, contrary to what you want to believe, you are anti-vax if you're literally against a vaccine 
that is going to help us end the pandemic. I know that anti-vax has a lot of negative connotations and it makes you seem like a crazy person, but I mean, if the shoe fits, you're wearing it, right? So stop being anti-vax and we won't call you anti-vax. Get the fucking vaccine, shut the fuck up, let's all move on from this goddamn pandemic once and for all. Jesus Christ, this isn't that hard. They made me say things I didn't say. Mm. They just put pieces together, thousands of pieces of my show. And so when I went into trial for the last trial, after prison, after I got out of prison, I was put on trial again. Mm. And in that, the lawyers got all that tape that the government had edited. The government did it. Just like now. This is cancel culture. And they took it apart and put it back the way it was on the show. And the lies, they made me tell lies that weren't there. Unbelievable. And when the, when the, when the, the uh, courts heard this, they saw the first video, what the government had edited, and then they saw the one from the original. They voted unanimously that I wasn't guilty. Wow. Nobody knows these That's things, right. hardly. It was in the paper, the same papers that brought me down, but it was like two inches in the back of the paper. Jim Baker wins. It was cancel culture. That's right. They did everything to cancel me. That was televangelist Jim Baker eloquently explaining how if you get caught committing fraud and embezzling money and you go to prison for it, that's actually cancel culture. It's not you being held accountable because you were found guilty of crimes by a jury. That's actually just another form of cancel culture. And seeing that Jim Baker went to prison in the 1980s, it goes to show you how far back we can find these examples of cancel culture. I mean, look, folks, we have to ask ourselves this question. Do we really want to live in a society where people can't even defraud others and embezzle money without getting canceled? I mean, do we live in a dictatorship? This is cancel culture. Obviously, I'm being facetious if your sarcasm detector is broken, but this is the logical conclusion of uh, cancel culture discourse in the United States of America. Yeah. Now, if you really want to know why Jim Baker went to prison, we have more details by Right Wing Watch, and Kyle Montala explains, in 1989, televangelist Jim Baker was convicted by a jury of 24 counts of fraud and conspiracy and sentenced to 45 years in prison for having bilked members of the Praise the Lord ministry out of hundreds of millions of dollars. Baker had raised these funds by selling lifetime partnerships to viewers that entitled them to an annual free stay at his Heritage USA Christian theme park. But the number of partnerships sold far exceeded the park's capacity and millions of dollars were diverted to fund Baker's own lavish lifestyle. Baker's sentence was subsequently reduced on appeal and he was released from prison in 1994. Baker's claim that he was found not guilty by a subsequent jury is misleading and self-serving as author John Wigger explained in his book, PTL, The Rise and Fall of Jim and Tammy Faye Baker's Evangelical Empire. And in that book, it reads, a year and a half after he was released from custody, Baker went to trial one more time. In 1990, he'd been convicted of common law fraud in order to pay $129 million. At that trial, the judge ruled that people who paid for lifetime partnerships at Heritage USA had done so primarily for the free lodging, not as a financial investment. In September of 1994, a federal appeals court reversed that ruling, reinstating securities fraud charges against Baker. Before the new case went to trial in July of 1996, the former PTL partners, represented by California attorney Tom Anderson, stipulated that they would no longer seek to collect the earlier $129 million judgment against Baker. Instead, they now sought to collect $121 million from the insurance company that had covered PTL against acts of negligence, but not against fraud. The case turned on the relatively narrow question of whether the lifetime partnerships were securities or investments, not just the promise of free lodging. For the first time, 
Baker engaged with his lawyers in preparing a defense. They hired Ron Heacock, a 14-year police veteran, to review 200 hours of videotape from PTL telethons, much as the prosecution had done at Baker's criminal trial in 1989. Heacock put together excerpts from the telethons in which Baker explained that money given for the lifetime partnerships would also be used to fund PTL as a whole. Of course, at other times, Baker left this out. But from the standpoint of whether he was selling securities, the evidence was convincing. After two and a half hours of deliberation, the jury sided with Baker and the insurance company. Baker would later claim that the verdict vindicated him of fraud in the sale of lifetime partnerships, but the case was never about that. The plaintiffs had forfeited the $129 million fraud verdict against Baker simply because he had no money for them to collect. So those are the juicy details. And if you're wondering, did Jim Baker learn his lesson? Well, um, the short answer to that is no, because He's still a huckster, currently being sued for selling what he argued was a cure for COVID-19. But hey, by his logic, that's just cancel, cancel culture. culture. If you can't defraud people and embezzle money, well, I mean, you're just being canceled. It's just the authoritarian leftists and the liberal woke media who won't even let people get away with committing fraud. I mean, look. With the trajectory of the cancel culture discourse, I don't think there's any valid conversations left to be had about this subject. Any and everything that's done against you, any criticism, that's all categorized as cancel culture now. What's that? I went to prison because I was found guilty of defrauding people by a, a, an actual jury? Cancel culture. What? I was accused of inappropriately touching women? Well, Andrew Cuomo says that's cancel culture, too. It was cancel culture. Anything that I don't like, any wrong that I'm called out for, that is tantamount to cancel culture. And since cancel culture is bad, then the accusations against these individuals must also be bad. Like, it's a really sleazy psychological trick because a lot of folks, they just have this visceral response to cancel culture. They don't like it because they associate it with things that they deem are bad and they don't want to be canceled themselves. They don't want to, you know, be fired from their jobs because they said something inappropriate or politically incorrect on social media. So they just think, oh, well, this person is saying, is saying that they're being canceled. I can empathize with that and I don't want to be canceled as well. So it's really just this manipulative tactic now. That's what it's become, at least, to get people to be sympathetic towards your position, but in actuality, no, you weren't canceled, Jim Baker, because you went to prison. You were convicted by a jury and went to prison because you defrauded people to the tune of millions of dollars and you enriched yourself by lying to people. If that's cancel culture, then cancel culture is good because I think that there should be legal accountability if you rip people off. So in a way... What folks who uh, like overuse cancel culture are going to end up inadvertently doing is bringing this entire argument full circle where they make cancel culture actually seem based. What's that? Andrew Cuomo was called out for sexual misconduct and he's saying that that's cancel culture. Well, I think that you should be called out for inappropriate touching. Cancel culture, therefore, must be good. Like, do you understand? Like, the argument has become so absurd that they're going to force people to flip when it comes to cancel culture because everyone is using it as an excuse now. And it's truly just insufferable. Look, we live in a society where we all make mistakes. Sometimes we commit crimes. Some people commit crimes, in particular Jim Baker. And you get imprisoned for that. You get called out for saying something politically incorrect a couple of years ago. That's just the nature of society. It's going to continue to happen. Um... But you can't just reduce everything down to this overly simplistic argument that, oh, I'm being canceled. The woke mob is coming after me because you're full of it. You're full of shit and everyone can see right through you. So, um, yeah, I don't think that there's much uh, left to say about this. This televangelist, Jim Baker, has continued to sell snake oil and defraud people. And so uh, I think that he's anticipating the next imprisonment or lawsuit going against him. And he's already kind of like trying to set people up to believe that if they come after him, this is just cancel culture and there's no way that he can possibly be guilty because, of course, him being seen as this huckster that he is isn't good for his grift. So he's trying to keep his audience. But, I mean, there's this cynical side of me that thinks if you're getting taken advantage of by someone this deliberate, 
who's this brazen of a snake oil salesman that I mean, I don't feel bad for you. Maybe you deserve to be taken advantage of if you're this stupid, honestly. Like, I don't feel bad for people who buy his scam cures and stuff like that if you're that fucking stupid. Like, stop believing people who you look up to. Stop believing that they have your intentions or have the best intentions and they're looking out for you. They're trying to line their pockets. That's it. See it for what it is. Stop being rubes and stop bitching about fucking cancel culture for the love of God, Jesus Christ. <laughs> As vaccinations continue to tick up, daily new COVID-19 cases are continuing to trend downward. And that's really, really good news. But having said that, the protections put in place during the pandemic are still very much needed because it is going to take years to build back what we lost during the pandemic. People who lost their jobs, lost their health insurance, lost their livelihoods are still trying to find their footing. Some still haven't yet, and it's going to take time. So you can't just automatically declare the pandemic over and get rid of all of the protections put in place during the pandemic. If we actually care about people, then we have to make sure that there are still protections that remain in place for a while. But there are some individuals, oligarchs in particular, like Charles Koch, the Koch brother, who did not die, who's already trying to undo pandemic era protections. And He's doing this before the pandemic is even over yet. So as Andrew Perez and David Sirota of the Daily Poster explain, billionaire Charles Koch's foundation has bankrolled three conservative legal groups leading the court battle to eliminate prohibitions against tenant evictions during the COVID-19 outbreak. At the same time, Koch's corporate empire has suddenly stepped up its real estate purchases during the pandemic, including making large investments in real estate companies with a potential financial interest in eliminating eviction restrictions. In the last few months, Months, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, the Pacific Legal Foundation, and the New Civil Rights Alliance have been pushing federal courts to strike down the CDC's eviction moratorium, which is designed to protect millions of Americans from being thrown out of their homes during the pandemic. The groups have so far won two rulings. Between 2017 and 2019, the Charles Koch Foundation contributed almost $7.7 million to those three conservative organizations, according to the foundation's tax returns reviewed by the Daily Poster. So long story short, it is not lucrative to have these moratoriums on evictions for an extended period of time. Landlords, real estate developers, they want to make money. So they want these eviction uh, moratoriums to be gone as soon as possible. And they're winning that battle. And Charles Koch is helping to bankroll this process because he also has financial incentives to make sure that these moratoriums on evictions go the way of the dodo. It's truly disgusting. I mean, evicting people in general, that in and of itself is wrong, considering we have to decommodify housing in America. But to do this during a pandemic, that is really like a unique kind of evil. And to push for this, it's just, it's gross. I mean, I don't have much to add here to the story because I think that the details speak for themselves here. They're trying to evict people during a pandemic who are struggling to survive. The federal government offered almost no help compared to other developed countries. And already, the pandemic's not even over, and what little protections remain in place, we have right-wing ghouls who are trying to get them uh, thrown out. It's just um, despicable, but this isn't at all shocking when we live in a late-stage capitalist society where policy is dictated by what the oligarch and uh, ruling elites want. I think that it's important to shine a light on what he's doing because this truly cannot just go without mentioning. I know that folks are used to Charles Koch being a piece of shit, and I know that this is basically what we expect in our society now, which cares more about profit than people, but we still shouldn't just like not talk about it because we're numb. We should still call it out and shame these idiots who do things like this that are just absolutely to the detriment of uh, public health and just humanity in general. So we've been seeing a bit of friendly competition between two oligarchs, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. And as you all know by now, Elon Musk, he has his space company, SpaceX, and Blue Origin is owned by Jeff Bezos. So these two oligarchs have been competing for a private government contract with NASA that is very, very lucrative. And unfortunately for Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk emerged victorious. However, there are some United States senators, one in particular, who feel really bad that this oligarch didn't get this multi-billion dollar contract for his private space firm. So what did the Senate decide to do? 
carve out their own allocation of resources so Jeff Bezos can also get his own private government contract so both of these oligarchs can be satisfied. I wish I were making this up, but I'm not. The details are that shocking. So as Sarah Sirota and Ryan Grimm of The Intercept report, now that Jeff Bezos' spaceflight company Blue Origin has lost a multi-billion dollar contract to Elon Musk's SpaceX, Congress is prepping the ground for Bezos to win a contract anyway, ordering NASA to make not one, but two awards. The order would come through the Endless Frontier Act, a bill to beef up resources for science and technology research that's being debated on the Senate floor this week. An amendment was added to that legislation by Senator Maria Cantwell of Washington to hand over $10 billion to NASA, money that will most likely go to Blue Origin, a company that's headquartered in Cantwell's home state. Oh, very telling. Cantwell's amendment is no sure bet, though. Senator Bernie Sanders introduced the last-minute amendment Monday to eliminate the $10 billion. Quote, it does not make a lot of sense to me that we would provide billions of dollars to a company owned by the wealthiest guy in America, Sanders told The Intercept on Tuesday. Blue Origin spent $625 thousand dollars lobbying the senate in the first three months of 2021 according to lobbying disclosure records among that spending was fifty thousand dollars to a team of lobbyists at a firm called clark hill that would specifically focus on the moon landing program the team includes john culberson a former member of the house from texas and one-time chair of the house appropriation subcommittee that covers science policy the white house also appointed culberson last year to the national space council users advisory group that makes policy recommendations to NASA. After the loss, Blue Origin and Dynetics filed protests with the Government Accountability Office, which currently remain open, but Congress seems to want to bypass the watchdog with a multi-billion dollar handout to NASA to award more contracts. So this is being done at the behest of Jeff Bezos, presumably just to make sure that he's happy. Are we shocked? I don't think anyone who watches this channel and knows that we live in a late-stage capitalist society is going to be shocked by this. But, I mean, this is why I say all the time that normal Americans do not have an impact on policy outcomes, and also because this is backed up by political science research. So, a 2014 Princeton University study confirmed that normal Americans have a statistically insignificant impact on policy outcomes. However, when they measured the impact and influence of business interests and elites and how much sway they have over policy outcomes, they have all the say over policy outcomes. And we're seeing this in action. Not only does Maria Cantwell want this contract awarded because this is essentially pork, this benefits her state, it'll create jobs in her state, but also because they want to make sure that Jeff Bezos, who may or may not fund future campaigns, who's been lobbying a lot of members of Congress, they want to make sure that this individual stays happy. And so if you're forced to choose between one of two companies, both run by oligarchs with a lot of power and influence, well, I mean, what's the best step to take? You just make both of them happy and you award the contract originally to one company, but then you carve out a special exemption for Jeff Bezos' company as well and make sure that his company gets billions of dollars too. This is in a country where we have to beg the Democratic Party's president, Joe Biden, to just cancel $10,000 of student loan debt, or you have to beg the president to give us the $2,000 that he promised, as opposed to $1,400, the watered-down amount. But yet, when it comes to things like this, they have all the money in the world. Now, I subscribe to modern monetary theory, so I do not believe that taxes fund spending. But if you are of the belief that we only have a limited amount of resources, which the overwhelming majority of members of Congress do, and in the Senate does, uh, does. I mean, are they not showing where their priorities lie? Are they not telling you everything that you need to know about them? They care more about the feelings of oligarchs than they do about normal Americans, and that is morally reprehensible. So, I mean, I don't have much commentary to add here. I think that the details of the story speaks for itself. And I think that if you live in Washington state, then you should have a lot of questions for your senator who very clearly isn't looking out for your interests. And she seems to be fighting harder for a multi-billionaire, an oligarch than you. And you should ask her about this the next time you have the opportunity to do so at a town hall. So I was today years old when I found out that if you feed your children a particular brand of cereal, that cereal could actually either turn them gay or make them question their gender identity. And this is actually the point of the cereal company in 
producing said serial. And if you don't believe me, well, I'm going to have a serious news person on a very serious news network explain to you how this is actually the case. All right. Woke culture is annoying folks, right? Plain and simple. These nonsense ideologies are being forced into our everyday lives. Listen to the latest lunacy. Kellogg's, a cereal brand, has come out with a woke cereal. Yes, a woke cereal. This new cereal called Together with Pride features all the Kellogg cereal characters like Tony the Tiger and Toucan Sam on the box to promote Pride Month. Come on, man. The cereal is rainbow hearts covered in edible glitter. How nice. Give me a break. Here's the worst part. The cereal slogan, too amazing to put into a box and then lists a space for kids to write in their own pronouns. Seriously, whatever happened to box tops on cereal boxes? Now you have pronoun spaces. Anyway, isn't Kellogg's a little late to this woke game, by the way? General Mills has a... I think General Mills has a gay leprechaun, right? Well, my producer Carly asked me, is that leprechaun really gay? I said, I don't know, maybe. He wears high heeled shoes, prances around in tights. Leads me to believe probably that little Lucky Charm leprechaun might be gay. But here's the thing. For those of you that want to vilify me for those comments, right, right there, aren't you just as offended by the flamboyant rainbow hearts and glitter as a symbol of gayness? See, there are two standards here. Nothing like forcing our kids to be confused about their gender first thing in the morning with their breakfast. All right, the moral of the story here is switch your kids to granola. It's healthier anyway. You cut the sugar, okay, and then you don't have to buy products from woke companies like Ben and Jerry's, Coke, and Kellogg's. Okay, I'm going to preface this entire conversation by saying that I am fully aware of the fact that companies like Kellogg's and other multi-billion dollar companies are trying to hijack pride in order to virtue signal in a shameless attempt to cultivate goodwill and cash in on pride. That is absolutely the case. I don't think anyone from the LGBTQ plus community would deny that. And it feels a little bit gross, right? So we all acknowledge this. It's not like we're all rah-rah when, when we see Shell who is destroying the planet, change their logo to the rainbow flag. Like, that is nothing more than corporate PR. But, of all the issues that affect the LGBTQ plus community, corporate hijacking of pride is like at the very, very bottom of the issues that I care about. I care more about equality, and if these large multinational corporations want to change their rainbow logo, um, that's their own prerogative. I'll just be sure to avoid all the comments underneath their social media posts when they do this because they're very homophobic and transphobic. Having said that, though, it's interesting to me uh, because individuals like this guy, the Newsmax host, what's the main criticism uh, that... The, the, like the main thing that they'll say about the wokesters, they'll say they're too hypersensitive, they get offended too easily, but yet in his criticism of woke serial, he sounds a lot like the wokesters that he's criticizing. Doesn't he sound a little bit too easily sensitive isn't the things that he's saying about this cereal box a little bit snowflakey is it just me he says woke culture is annoying these woke ideologies are being forced into our everyday lives i mean i literally wouldn't have even heard about this cereal had it not been for this segment i mean maybe i'm just not hip with what the kids are eating nowadays but these are things that aren't necessarily being shoved down your throats you know this is one thing that homophobes and anti-lgbtq plus people say they'll say the heightened visibility of gay people and the gay flag rather this is just you know that ideology being shoved down our throats when in actuality they just don't want to be reminded that gay and trans people exist that is the core issue here. It's not that like it's changing our lives in a real concrete way. His life isn't being changed at all because of homosexuality or people being transgender. But to him, the high invisibility, that's the issue because look, let's face it, he's offended by it. He's a little snowflake who doesn't want to see the rainbow flag because he probably has some issues with his own gender identity or sexual orientation and You know, it reminds him that he could have been living an entirely different life had he not been brainwashed by a particular religion 
I don't know, not going to try to psychoanalyze him too much, but he's being a snowflake right here. That's the bottom line. Now, furthermore, he goes on to argue, I think General Mills has a gay leprechaun, right? He wears high heel shoes and prances around in tights. Now, I don't know what the point of this part was. Maybe he's trying to say, look, Kellogg's, they're not doing anything innovative and new. And he'd be correct about that. But those aren't high heels or tights, my dude. Like, what? Were you looking at the picture as you had it up on the screen? I will say, though, as for his observation that the Lucky Charms leprechaun may be gay, I will actually concede that. That's very possible. I always kind of, like, thought of him as being pansexual, possibly bisexual, but I think that is a relatively astute observation for a Newsmax host. So, good on him for uh, catching that. But he adds, for those of you who want to vilify me for those comments, aren't you just as offended by the flamboyant rainbow hearts and glitter as a symbol of gayness? Well, no, because unlike you, I don't get offended by cereal boxes. <laughs> Like, he's trying so hard to sell the outrage, but this is nothing. I don't get it. Like, this is why I have a hard time taking any conservative serious, because these are the things that they talk about on a supposedly serious news network. Cereal boxes being woke and turning your children gay, and that's like the main argument that he's making here. He says that this is bad. The reason why this is an issue, and it's not just about him being a snowflake, is because there are two standards here. Nothing like forcing our kids to be confused about their gender first thing in the morning with their breakfast. So he's arguing, literally, that if your kid sees this cereal box, they're going to start being confused about their gender. First of all, if your kid is confused about their gender, I don't think it's because of a cereal box. But if we granted that it was due to the cereal box then wouldn't you also be as equally concerned at your child seeing the Honey Nut Cheerios honeybee on the box? Like, wouldn't they start to think that they're a honeybee? Wouldn't they think that if they saw the Mario uh, cereal, that they could take off their hat, throw it, and then jump on it to get onto higher platforms? I mean, are you serious? Like, there's no way that he's serious. I know that conservatives use hyperbole to make their arguments and they try to sell it as a literal argument, but does he actually believe this? Is he stupid enough to think that a cereal box is going to make your kid question their gender? Is that honestly what you believe? Like, I want to ask him this question. Do you genuinely believe that if you give your child this cereal and they see the box and they can fill out their own pronouns, all of a sudden they're going to be gay or transgender? Is that honestly what you think? I mean, Jesus Christ. How fragile are your children? Perhaps you're a bad parent if your kid is that easily persuaded and you need to instill, you know, some foundational values into them. Well, maybe you shouldn't do that, but I mean, like, perhaps your kid should know about empirical reality. Perhaps you should be educating your kid. If your kid is that, like, easily manipulated, then you've got a lot more issues to be concerned with than their gender identity and sexuality when they grow up. I, I just, like, it's never, ever not astonishing to me to see how they will simultaneously denounce the hypersensitivity of the woke people. And then while they're denouncing the wokesters, they act like the biggest snowflakes ever. It's just honestly, the irony is lost on them, but I will never not point this out because I genuinely enjoy showcasing their blatant hypocrisy. It's just honestly, it's too much. So I very rarely get to talk about good news on this program because usually there isn't much good news but believe it or not i actually have a little bit of a dose of hopium for you and it is it's pure raw hopium that you can inject directly into your veins and this is some good news regarding the fight to stop climate catastrophe and this could be the start of something very very significant. So for more on this, we go to Jessica Corbett of Common Dreams, who explains climate campaigners worldwide are celebrating after a Dutch court on Wednesday ordered fossil fuel giant Royal Dutch Shell to cut its carbon emissions by 45% by 2030 compared with 2019 levels, a historic ruling that activists hope is just the beginning of holding the oil and gas industry accountable for driving the climate emergency. This is a landslide victory for climate justice, said Sarah Shaw of Friends of the Earth International. Our hope is 
is that this verdict will trigger a wave of climate litigation against big polluters to force them to stop extracting and burning fossil fuels. This result is a win for communities in the global south who face devastating climate impacts now. The first of its kind ruling, which Shell told the Wall Street Journal it expects to appeal, came from the district court in The Hague and is the result of legal action brought by Friends of the Earth Netherlands, along with over 17,000 individuals and six other organizations. The individual co-plaintiffs and groups, which included Action Aid, Both Ends, Fossil Vrije NL, Greenpeace Netherlands, Jongren Milieu Actief, and the Wadenveringen, I'm not even going to try, I'm so sorry for butchering that, demanded that Shell's emissions reduction goals align with the Paris Climate Agreement, which aims to limit global heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100. The court orders Royal Dutch Shell to reduce its CO2 output and those of its suppliers and buyers by the end of 2030 by a net of 45% based on 2019 levels, the court said, according to Agents France Press. Royal Dutch Shell has to implement this decision at once. So I know that this seems insignificant right now, and perhaps at this moment, it isn't going to amount to that much, right? This is just one court who's saying one company has to comply with this reduction in emissions. Having said that, though, as the article pointed out, this could be the moment where the dam bursts open. We just needed a little bit of a leak, and now the floodgates may be opening up. But we don't know. But I want to get to some reactions from individuals who have been following this. Bill McKibben writes, wow, wow, wow. Dutch court orders Shell to cut the absolute level of its carbon emissions almost in half by 2030. This could be game changing. Jillian Ambrose, who is a journalist for The Guardian who covers energy and the fossil fuel industry, writes, it is genuinely hard to overstate quite how big a deal this ruling is for Shell and the oil industry. Shell said it plans to appeal the, quote, disappointing decision of the Dutch courts, but it might be a better use of time to figure out how to make these carbon cuts. Roger Cox, lawyer for Friends of the Earth Netherlands, said this is a turning point in history, the first time a judge has ordered a large polluting corporation to comply with the Paris Climate Agreement. This ruling may also have major consequences for other big polluters. Sarah Shaw from Friends of the Earth International added, Our hope is that this verdict will trigger a wave of climate litigation against big polluters to force them to stop extracting and burning fossil fuels. This result is a win for communities everywhere who face devastating climate impacts now. So in other words, this is kind of a signal to smaller countries in the global south who are already dealing with the climate crisis to say, hey, this case showed that you can actually sue because you deserve to have a planet that is habitable, free of pollution. And in your area, these polluters who are absolutely decimating your, your countries, your states, you can actually now take action and be successful. Now, the last thing that I want to share, the last reaction that I want to share is a video from the attorney in this case, uh, or one of the attorneys, I'm assuming, and also the director of Friends of the Earth International. This is what they have to say about this. This is a historical moment for all of us. For the first time in history, a judge has ordered one of the largest polluters to stop contributing to dangerous climate change. The judge was crystal clear. Shell causes dangerous climate change and Shell should stop immediately with uh, doing that. It's a clear signal to all polluters in the world. You should get your act together. This is a major victory for the planet, for the 17,000 co-plaintiffs, the millions of people that have supported us in this uh, court case, for my three kids that now have uh, a, a clear perspective on a safe and healthy planet and future and for all children in the world. I am a happy man today. I think the, wor the, the world looks a bit brighter today than it did yesterday. I think this is a groundbreaking and historical uh, verdict. Uh, we're very happy with that, obviously. Uh, we also think that this will have a ripple effect uh, in other jurisdictions and we expect a lot of similar climate cases around the world against the big polluters. Uh, so yeah, this gives, this gives us also hope that uh, the energy transition that needs to speed up and needs to speed up quickly can actually happen uh, through these forceful uh, measures. Uh, so happy that we're here. So look, this might not amount to much in the end. Perhaps Shell appeals this ruling and they win. Perhaps this doesn't actually trigger other litigation against these fossil fuel companies. That 
is a possibility. But also, it's very possible that this is a turning point, as climate activists like Bill McKibben are saying. It is possible that this could actually be the start of a wave of litigation against the biggest fossil fuel extractors and polluters you know, around the globe. This could be the moment where we look back in history and say that was the start of when we saved the planet. I don't know. We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. Nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody can read the future. But what I do know is that for all the cynicism that's inside of me, this is at least giving me a little bit of hope that with the little bit of time we have left, maybe it's possible that we stop the worst of what climate change has to offer. Again, maybe it's too late, but maybe it isn't. But what I do know is that this is definitely fantastic news, and uh, I will take it. You don't see any linkage between Donald Trump saying the election's stolen and then Republicans in all of these state legislatures rushing to put in place these restrictive voter laws? Well, I think you have to look at the specifics of each one of those efforts. I think if you look at the Georgia laws, for example, there's been a lot that's been said nationally about the Georgia voter laws that turns out not to be true. But even the Republican Lieutenant Governor of Georgia, Jeff Duncan, said that there was, that when this bill started to pick up momentum was when Rudy Giuliani was testifying that the Georgia election was a sham. I don't think anyone doubts that the reason 400 some voting bills have been introduced, 90% by Republicans, supported by the Republican National Committee. I don't think it's a coincidence after the election that this has happened. Look, I think everybody should want a situation and a system where people who uh, ought to be able to vote and have the right to vote can vote, and people who you know don't shouldn't. And, and again, I come back to things like voter ID. But what problem are they ID. solving for? Like, there's well, no, like what look, are I all mean, these states doing? No, I think, I, well, each state is different. What was the big problem in Georgia that needed to be solved by a new law? What was the big problem in Texas? What was the big problem in Florida? What was the, th these laws are coming all around the states. And like, what are they solving for? I think you've got to look at each individual state law. But I think what we can all agree you can't on- can't divorce them from the context. Well, like, that was Liz Cheney. And after spending weeks trying to convince all of us that she's principled and she cares deeply about democracy, she's refusing to acknowledge that the big lie, which she rightfully condemns, is the catalyst for all of these Republican-led efforts across the country to further crack down on voting rights. Now, this is not the first time that she showed her true colors when it comes to this issue and showed how disingenuous she is. Because in my appearance on TYT, I explained why, if she genuinely cares about democracy as much as she says she does, there's one bill she could have supported that would have proven it to us. A broken clock is right twice a day. And Liz Cheney, thankfully, is objectively correct on this issue. Having said that, though, it does worry me, and I'm going to get a little bit more cynical here, that Democrats like Nancy Pelosi applaud her for her courageousness. Because it's not like Liz Cheney is doing this because she genuinely cares about democracy. If she cared about democracy, she would have supported HR1 before the People Act. It passed the House and Liz Cheney voted nay on the For the People Act. So if she actually cared about the legislative push around the country using the big lie that she's denouncing now, she would have supported that piece of legislation. Excellent point, Mike. Now, there's one more piece of evidence that should convince anyone who's in denial that the big lie is what's fueling all of these efforts across the country to actually crack down further on voting rights. It's a poll from Reuters and Ipsos that found that Republicans across the country overall believe that Trump is actually the true president, not Joe Biden. And because the last election was stolen in their opinion, they believe that these laws across the country in Georgia and Florida are actually warranted. They're a legitimate response to an election that they believe was stolen. Now, for more on this, Reuters explains, 56% of Republicans believe the election was rigged or the result of illegal voting, and 53% think Donald Trump is the actual president, not Joe Biden. Literally delusional. Uh, only 30% of Republicans feel confident that absentee or mail-in ballots were accurately counted, compared to 86% of Democrats and 55% of independents. As a result, 87% of Republicans believe it is important that the government place new limits on voting to protect elections from fraud. 
So even the Republicans like Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, who did not go along with Trump's big lie, they're still benefiting from it. They're using that big lie as a justification to further crack down on voting rights that disproportionately harms Democratic Party voters, people of color in particular, and helps them because they know that when voter turnout is lower, Republicans are more likely to win. And even though Liz Cheney will condemn the big lie, she won't condemn how her party is using the big lie as a justification to suppress voting rights. So make no mistake about it, Liz Cheney is a liar. She's telling on herself here. She's telling you that she doesn't actually care about the big lie. And even if what she's saying here is objectively correct, I mean, should she really be paraded around as if she's a hero? I mean, Nancy Pelosi applauded her for being so courageous and the mainstream media is propping her up as some sort of like principled Republican who America really needs. She doesn't care about democracy. She's doing this specifically for attention because there is a demand, however big or small it may be, within her party for some leader to emerge to be the antithesis of Donald Trump, and she wants to fill that void. I mean, it seems like that's not working out yet, but in the event she wants to run for president, perhaps she could present herself as the main alternative to Donald Trump or a Trumpian Republican like Ron DeSantis. I'm not sure, but what I do know is that don't fall for Liz Cheney. Sure, she's correct that the election wasn't stolen and Trump's big lie was harmful, but she then subsequently denies why it's harmful because of things like this, voter suppression efforts like this, using Trump's big lie to justify their crackdown on voting rights. Liz Cheney is absolutely shameless and nobody should applaud her for doing the bare minimum and acknowledging reality. In the beginning of April, Forbes reported that the Biden administration was actively considering canceling student loan debt of up to $50,000. And after nearly two months of deliberation, Predictably, the Biden administration has decided that they're not going to do the popular and sensible thing. It's a no. Now, as Zach Friedman of Forbes explains, according to The Washington Post, President Joe Biden will not include any student loan cancellation in his annual budget, while the annual budget, which is expected at the end of next week, only contains major policy plans that have already been released by the Biden administration. It's another major policy setback for student loan cancellation. As a presidential candidate, Biden called for Congress to cancel up to $10,000 of student loans for student loan borrowers, but hasn't enacted any policy for student loan cancellation through an executive order. And that's his issue. So it seems as if he doesn't want to cancel student loan debt via executive order. If he's going to cancel anything, he wants it to be done legislatively. But yet he also isn't really fighting to get rid of the filibuster. And even if that were the case, he doesn't want to cancel more than $10,000. So, um, yeah, this is a bad idea. In 2022, what Democrats need is one surefire thing that they could point to and brag about to get young people motivated to come out. They can say, look, we canceled $10,000, $25,000, $50,000 worth of student debt. And if you want more relief, come out and vote for us and we'll do something else. We'll do X, Y, Z. But they're not choosing to do that. And people are rightfully speculating whether or not they even want to win. As Nathan J. Robinson of Current Affairs points out, it's insanity. One for the, my God, they must be trying to lose file. Think how easy it is to make the case for voting Democrat to a young person who has $10,000 less debt because of you. And how much harder it is to make the case to a young person who expected that and was lied to. And that's exactly it. If you run on the most progressive policy platform ever... You have to deliver on at least some promises, but it's been a couple of months into Biden's administration and he's already walked back uh, key promises. The public option. Anybody heard about the public option? No. Uh, when it comes to deportations, even though initially he tried to halt deportations for the first 100 days after a court blocked that, well, he ended up going on to be as terrible as Obama when it comes to the issue of deportations and on Israel, Palestine, also predictably terrible. So the thing is, Biden has to put up. Otherwise, in 2022, Democrats aren't going to fare too well. 
because they need turnout to be high. They need turnout to be higher than usual, considering all of the voter suppression efforts taking place in Republican controlled states across the country. So you need more people than ever to come out. And Joe Biden isn't giving people that much of a reason. Yes, he's done some positive things. The COVID relief package, the $1,400 stimulus that was supposed to be 2000 that was helpful. Even if he did go back on that promise, uh, his handling of COVID-19, his rollout of vaccinations has been good. But really what you want to do is motivate young people to get out and vote who the Democrats always fail to mobilize. And the easiest thing you can do is just cancel at least $10,000 of student debt via executive order. He should be canceling 50000 worth, but even just 10000 I mean, that's objectively good for young people, right? You can't deny it. It's less than it should be. It's less than Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and any other presidential candidate, but it's undeniably a good thing, even if it is just an incremental step. But he won't even do that because he wants to have it take place legislatively. Okay, well, if you are still trying to work with Republicans on every single thing and you're unwilling to take executive action, then uh, don't complain when you lose ground in 2022. Because this is what's going to happen if you refuse to actually be bold and meet the moment. Over the course of the last couple of weeks, I've applauded the squad for being courageous and brave in standing up to the Biden administration because he offers unconditional support to Israel while they commit atrocities in Gaza. So, you know, it's important to give them credit where it's due. I believe in positive reinforcement, but I also believe in objectivity. And when they let us down, when they aren't courageous and bold, I think we also have to point that out as well. And this issue that we're going to talk about is explicitly the fault of a couple of members of the squad who at the last moment chose not to hold strong, chose to buckle under pressure. So the founder of the Civil Rights Corps, Alec Karakatsanis, gives us the details about what happened in a thread on Twitter. A major scandal is happening right this moment on the House floor, and he wrote this on May 20th, by the way. Uh, mainstream Democrats are quietly trying to ram through a $1.9 billion budget increase to the Capitol Police, military, and and DHS supposedly because January 6th showed that they need more funding. For those of you who are new to this, of the many things that went wrong on January 6th, insufficient funding for Capitol Police and bloated military bureaucracy was not one of them. This is part of a long pattern. Police work with liberal reformers to use their own violence, waste, brutality, and incompetence to justify increased budgets. All people of goodwill must speak out against the latest attempt by the Democrats to waste money expanding state bureaucracy, violence, militarization, and surveillance. All of these instruments will be turned against the most vulnerable people in our society. Some of the only people opposing this violent nonsense are Ilhan Omar, Ayanna Presley, Cori Bush, AOC, Jamal Bowman, and Rashida Tlaib. So I just want to pause and give you some further context. These things that lawmakers know will be unpopular, that they try to rush through, I mean, this is just shameless. But now, thankfully, we have principal progressives who are willing to stand up and block these sorts of things from getting passed. I mean, when you see something that's really harmful and egregious, I think that you have a responsibility to speak up and stop it if you're aware of it. Sometimes lawmakers vote on things that they don't even know about, right? But here, thankfully, they caught it and they stopped it from happening. They had the votes to stop it, or so we thought, from passing. But unfortunately, Alec chimed in with an update that is just devastating and, quite frankly, depressing. Devastating news. This dangerous bill passed 213 to 212, with Representative AOC, Rashida Tlaib, and Jamal Bowman abandoning their positions and voting present instead of against it, thus supporting giving cops more money and weapons to use against the most vulnerable people. I want to repeat that. It passed 213 to 212. And it's because three members of the squad caved. Had they voted against it rather than voting present, they would have effectively blocked this. This is absolutely inexcusable and it shows a real lack of courage and an unwillingness to lead now first of all let me just give credit to ayanna presley cory bush and ilhan omar for standing strong here there was no reason to buckle 
they had the votes to stop this. But because of their refusal to stay strong, it passed. I mean, what were they thinking? I mean, there has to be some sort of explanation here. Why they backed down, where they promised something. I mean, this really is one of those instances where I'm not going to be overly char charitable here and try to justify their actions. There's really no excuse for this. You let us down, period. You let us down at a time when we needed you. And now the military, DHS, Capitol Police, they're going to get more funding because you chose to vote present rather than voting against it. Now, let me remind you of a correct criticism of Tulsi Gabbard when she voted present when it came to Donald Trump's second impeachment. This is what AOC said. Today was very consequential, and to not take a stand one way or another in a day of such grave consequence to this country is quite difficult. We're sent here to lead, she said. And guess what? Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was 100% correct right there in her criticism of Tulsi Gabbard. It was a cowardly stand to vote president then, and this is very cowardly right now. So I think that because the left supported these members of Congress and helped them get elected, it is important that they explain to us why, at the time when they really could have flexed their muscle, they let us down and they voted present when they could have easily defeated this effort to increase funding to the military and DHS and Capitol Police. I mean, it's just, it's really disappointing. This is damaging not just because of the policy implications of what they just let happen, but also because new Justice Democrats will be running for Congress in 2022, and people who have funded your campaigns are no longer going to want to fund the campaigns of new progressives because they're going to think, oh, well, if you're just going to cave when we need you the most, what's the point of giving my hard-earned dollars to these new progressives? So they have to be bold, and they have to prove to people that them being in Congress is useful, and it is useful, right? They just demonstrated how courageous they were over the course of the last couple of weeks when they boldly denounced Israel and the Biden administration when Rashida Tlaib confronted Biden to his face over his support for Israel. But now, less than a week later to do this and cave, it's just, it's deeply, deeply discouraging. And I hope that they truly learn from this experience and do better because this ain't it here and this is hurtful long term to the movement and electing more electing more progressives overall so this is absolutely unacceptable and inexcusable and i hope that they address this and i hope that a journalist actually who has uh, the ability to ask them about this does question them here because this is something that absolutely cannot stand you were sent to Congress to represent the interests of the people, and you ran against increases to the military for our police state. And for you to do this is absolutely a betrayal that I hope they apologize for and correct. In February of this year, I was supposed to give a keynote speech at Georgia Southern University. Before the event, I refused to sign a state-mandated pledge to not boycott Israel in order to speak. My invitation was rescinded and the conference canceled as a result. I decided to sue the state of Georgia because signing an anti-BDS clause in order to work in the state is a direct violation of my constitutional rights to free speech and to participate in political boycotts. So not too long ago in this program, we talked about a lawsuit involving Abby Martin and the state of Georgia as it relates to their anti-BDS laws. And back then I said that this was one of the most important cases relating to free speech in America because the implications of this law are absolutely, truly far-reaching and how shameless the state of Georgia was in their disregard for the U.S. Constitution and freedom of speech. I mean, if something like this were to stand... I mean, I don't even know what to say. It would just be bad for free speech in America. And if you truly care about freedom of speech, then this is one of those issues where you had to pay attention to the outcome of this. Now, I'll link you to that down below if you want some more details. But I do want to talk about this again because there's a major update to this particular story. As Partnership for Civil Justice Fund tweets, breaking huge victory in our BDS free speech case in Georgia on behalf of Abby Martin, federal court rules Georgia's anti-BDS law 
unconstitutional, violates Abby's First Amendment and due process rights by demanding she renounce support for BDS, co-counsel R. Care National, and PCJF. Now, in response to this, Abby Martin released the statement, uh, but first via Twitter, she says, proud to announce that we have officially won our lawsuit against the state of Georgia's anti-BDS law, which has been struck down as a result of our case. And her statement reads, I am thrilled at the judge's decision to strike down this law that so clearly violates the free speech rights of myself and so many others in Georgia. My First Amendment rights were restricted on behalf of a foreign government, which flies in the face of the principles of freedom and democracy. The government of Israel has has pushed state legislatures to enact these laws only because they know that sympathy and support for the population they brutalize, occupy, ethnically cleanse, and subject to apartheid is finally growing in popular consciousness. They want to hold back the tide of justice by preemptively restricting the right of American citizens to peacefully take a stand against their crimes. As the world watches Israeli aggression continue in Jerusalem, the West Bank, and against the population of besieges in Gaza, it has never been more urgent to advance the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against the Israeli regime. The striking of this law is a necessary and timely opening to build this urgent task. And so now the law that's on the books in Georgia is officially unenforceable because predictably it violates the Constitution. The question was whether or not a court would agree that it violates the Constitution. But to, to think that it doesn't violate the Constitution would be unthinkable. You would have to not know anything about the Constitution and it would be um, absurd for a judge to not see this for what it is. And Georgia knew that they were in trouble and they knew that this law was unconstitutional because once they learned about this lawsuit, they tried to actually change the law in order to have the case dismissed. So that way, you know, the judge wouldn't be able to accept this case because, well, if they change the law, then we're just ruling on an old law. But thankfully, this went in the right direction and we finally have some good news in America as it relates to freedom of speech and uh, the BDS movement in America. And anyone who actually purports to care about freedom of speech, but didn't actually talk about this case, which is incredibly consequential. I don't believe that they're truly aware of the threats to freedom of speech and democracy. So credit to Abby Martin. What she did here truly is one of the most important things to advance this pushback against, you know, repressing civil rights and civil liberties in America. And uh, this is absolutely huge. And I applaud her for this. And uh, I'm just... I'm just happy that this went the way that it did. It shouldn't be shocking. Like, we shouldn't feel relieved that a judge saw something for what it was as being brazenly unconstitutional. But in America, when up is down and uh, left is right and people are denying empirical reality, it still feels nice to confirm that what is obvious is indeed the case. The law where they brazenly shut down freedom of speech of people because of their political belief or participation in a movement is unconstitutional and um it's now struck down all right folks that is all that i have for you this week thank you so much if you've tuned in and made it this far in the episode uh, i really appreciate all of your viewership uh as usual before we leave i'm uh, gonna thank all of the people who support us on Patreon and PayPal. And if you want more of the Humanist Report, as always, you can watch us on twitch.tv slash Humanist Report on Thursdays at 7 p.m. PST. I'm there every single week. And we've got more news when it comes to uh, my live streams coming very, very shortly. So I will see you all next week. I don't think I have anything left to talk about. I'm spent. My, my brain is mush now underneath these really hot lights. So I'll see you all next week. Take care, everyone. My name is Mike Figueredo. This has been The Humanist Report. Bye.